Welcome to another round with this PCG level builder. If you haven't seen it yet, the other video on this tool is more of a quick walkthrough and basic guide for most of the general uses. The link will be just below for that. This video will be looking more in depth into the demo levels as well as some of the blueprints, uh, creating your own versions of a lot of the blueprints and various tips. The mesh set data asset drives this tool almost as equally as the PCG and blueprints systems do. You can think of it like a palette or a preset that you can quickly swap whenever you need. While there are definitely a lot of options in here, you really only need one thing to get started, and that's either a single length back wall or a path low mesh. This is another good reminder that most parameters and inputs have these hover tool tips to let you know what they're used for and some general tips to use with them as well. To create your own data asset, there's two ways you can go. You can either duplicate one of the existing mesh sets that I include with the pack, or you can right click in an empty spot in the content browser, start typing data asset, then in the class selection, type level in the quickest search, and the PDA level mesh set should appear. Select that. Name that new data asset, open it up, and start filling in whatever sections you need. Pretty much any section can have multiple entries, and that makes it so whenever one of these would be placed, it'll randomly choose any that you add to the list. These dashes are just UI filler to break it up, make it a little easier to read as well. The level builder is set up to only be able to input this kind of data asset, so those are the only ones that show up on the list here. You can swap whichever data asset you want at pretty much any time. Just keep in mind that when one data asset varies significantly from another, PCG might hold on to some old values and you'll want to hit the clean and regen buttons to clear it out. Occasionally actors might be left over even after cleaning but you can manually delete those before you regen again if you just want to be sure. Now let's dive into the door actors. The base blueprint is set up for either a basic swinging door that can be locked or unlocked or a hidden door that can be something destructible. Or you don't actually have to set anything in the blueprint what you do want to set though is in your mesh set and then on these door placement actors you will be telling it which parts of the mesh set to use along with what kind of door it is and whether it's locked or to use the black wall fader. The regular door types need a frame at the least but a door as well if you want it to be locked. And then the hidden door types need a frame a quote-unquote door that is kind of the filler placement or the, the hidden breakable part and then a geometry collection if you want something to shatter and you know, physics to react. On the low door section is basically what will be used if you have a front wall group. A couple notes here when building your own meshes. Um, if you need a separate glass mesh, you could be using nanite, you can use glass transparent materials on that. Just be sure to name it exactly the same as the door mesh, but with underscore glass at the end. And the blueprint will automatically find it and attach it. And then on the pivot for the door, if you want it to be attached and swing properly, you just want it to be offset in the same amount that your door frame is from world zero, if that makes sense. So if your frame is directly centered, then you don't have to worry about this, but my examples here, the door frame is pushed back a ways because of where the rocks are. So the door has to be pushed back even more for the blueprint to recognize the distance needed. Let's look at the light actors now. These are a bit different from the door in that you do need to set up pretty much everything in the blueprint beforehand. To create your own blueprint, you can either duplicate one of these existing ones or just make sure you're parenting it to the original base light so you can uh, right click the base and then create child blueprint from that. You can use whatever mesh you like or even multiple meshes. Same with the lights. You can use whatever type of light as well. Spotlight, point light, rec light, it doesn't matter. You can set the values on those um, to 
to whatever you like. But just keep in mind that the blueprint and the PCG will be setting the light color and the light intensity. So whatever you set there will be overridden. And the really important thing is that you keep the meshes at origin within the blueprint and then just offset the light to whatever fits with where your mesh's light is. And if you have really varied surfaces on your walls like I do, you want to extend the back or top side of your mesh so that it can clip into the walls at varying depths. The spacing parameters apply to all types of lights, whether on the wall or the ceiling. But the height is just for the wall lights. Ceiling lights will use your ceiling height and additional ceiling height value a little further up on the tool. And then the random disable chance value just makes it so the, the physical light itself as well as any emissive on the mesh will be turned off. And that's just random per actor. And just a reminder, but the ceiling lights will either run along the center of a path blueprint or they will use the kind of secondary spline on the room and that was driven by their light distance value. Turning now to the river spline tool. This is like pretty much any other spline mesh tool you can see in Unreal. The key difference here is that PCG actually reacts to wherever you place it. You just drop it in the world, draw out the spline as you like, and then set the mesh and material for it to use. I've included a more narrow and a wider mesh to use with this. You can also grab any spline point and scale its width to stretch it out as much as you need. I've also included a few material instances for you to try out. One's a single layer of water, and the other two are more of a stylized radioactive ooze or a lava. Next up is the decor blocker, which works really well with the river tool because you can keep some of the path open a little better. Anywhere the river goes, it will usually make it rockier and add some more of the bigger decor. But this blocker will clear out any path point so it only uses the, the low mesh from the mesh set and keeps any of the scatters and the, the larger decor from blocking away. This is also pretty handy to spread out anywhere you need area clear for a, either a battleground or maybe a cutscene. You just want to make sure nothing gets in the way of the characters. Just to keep this pack a little simpler, I kept all meshes included in here, just regular, no nano meshes. But if you want to enable that, uh, it's pretty quick. You can just select all or whichever meshes you want in the content browser and right click. And up towards the top with Nanite, you can either check the box or hit enable Nanite. The tool will work either way, no change is needed. Though it is probably best if you don't enable Nanite for the spline meshes. Some materials just won't work with that, and unless you enable nanite spline meshes in your project, it won't work either. Here's a quick overview of the demo general map, which is your best reference for just about anything I've mentioned in this and the other video. One extra here that I haven't covered yet are these sightline blockers. If you're setting up a level like I have with these, where you want it to kind of fade into the background, and the blackness, but you don't want to be, the player to be able to see anything off in the distance. This is a quick blueprint you can throw down. The default game mode that will play with any new project will just be none, which means it's kind of a spectator mode you can fly around. And that'll definitely work. You can see how the hidden door works. If you kind of butt into the, the center of it, you'll see a little hit message up on the side. Do that twice to break it open. Or, fly up towards the door to have it swing open. For a little better experience though, you want to hit the add button in the top left of the content browser and choose to add a feature content pack. 
And from there, you'll add the first or third person function. And then in the World Settings tab, under the Game Mode, the Game Mode drop-down, choose whichever one you import there. We've got the third person one here. Oh, and if you don't have that World Settings tab, you can grab that up at the very top left of the editor, under Window, in the World Settings. Here's a quick example of how a lock door works, too. You can edit the blueprints to whatever functionality you need, but the basic is there, so there's a key item in the world. And as long as that has the same data asset assigned to it as the door placement, then they'll kind of talk to each other and unlock once you've picked it up. And that's about it for now. And if you come across any bugs or have ideas for features that you'd like to see added to this, Please feel free to send it into the support email or even add a note to these YouTube videos. The support email will definitely get you the quicker response. Thanks again for watching and have a good one.